Can you hear me? Uh -huh. Okay, my name's David. I just had a question about proportional representation. It was in the media for a bit, and I haven't heard anything since. Okay. Uh, Justin Trudeau did promise to, to get rid of the first past the post voting system, so there was a lot of talk about proportional representation after the election. It remains a very hot topic in Quebec because the current government of Quebec, I don't know how many of you know this, the government of Quebec has committed to bring in mixed member proportional without a referendum. Uh, that's the, uh, that, that, that was a consensus position of all the parties in opposition in the last provincial election in Quebec, and they say they're still committed to it. The first province that gets rid of first past the post will be, like I said, a dominoes, and everybody else will get rid of first past the post because it's such a perverse voting system. The other province that's on the verge of getting rid of first past the post is Prince Edward Island, where right now, if the election were held today, the leader of the Green Party in Prince Edward Island would be premier because they're running way ahead in the polls of the Conservatives and the Liberals. But but Prince Edward Islanders voted in a referendum to bring in mixed member proportional. And the Liberal Premier said, well, not enough people voted, so we're going to ignore that referendum. Wow. And so it remains a hot topic in many parts of Canada. And as a Green leader going into a minority parliament, I would definitely ensure that the negotiations for who forms government include coming back to this and having a voting system. And, and I'll just add one point. It's hard because a lot of people say, well, of course the Green Party wants proportional representation. That's the only way the Greens will get more seats. I tell you from my heart, it, the thing that scares the heck out of me about first past the post is that it's a system that allows 39 to 40 percent of the voters to elect a majority government, and that's not just the voters, that's the people who voted. So in 2011, 60 percent of Canadians voted. If we'd allowed the, where most voters landed to form government, we would have had a, a majority government called the We Stay Home Party. <laughs> but instead, we had a majority conservative government because of the 60% who voted, 40% voted conservative. What I worry about is with the rise of people like Donald Trump or Doug Ford, we do not want to see an extremist with no policy background, no experience in government, seizing control because of what, celebrity or a fluky election. The first past the post voting system is dangerous because it could allow someone like that to have, in, in Canadian context, 40% of the vote means 100% of the power. So we'll keep coming back to it and we'll keep trying to get a fair voting system for Canada. So thank you for raising it, David. Yep. <laughs> I, the only, I, we cannot exploit any new sources of fossil fuels. We cannot bring in any new oil wells. We cannot expand any new bitumen production. In terms of infrastructure, we did have this debate at the Green Party Convention and left an exemption for we could have another refinery in order to use Canadian fossil fuels on a declining basis and not import any foreign oil to create more jobs here while we're still using fossil fuels back to, I think it was Ron's point about transition, this is one of the things I would want to see is that we say, okay, we're going to use Alberta bitumen by upgrading it, refining it, and using it in Canada, not exporting it abroad, and then we can shut down all the importation of oil from Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Kazakhstan, Nigeria, etc. So, where I am, 350.org is absolutely right. We have to divest of all fossil fuel investments, including Canada's pension plan board, where we are heavily invested in fossil fuels. We also have to ensure that we don't drill another well, start a new oil sands project. It's, it's from here, we go down and we get off fossil fuels as rapidly as possible so we can survive. And I really want to... make sure everybody knows while we're on the topic of climate and Leah's giving me the sign that I don't have much time left. This Friday, March 15th, is a global school strike. I don't know if kids are, does anyone here know if kids in Regina are there? Yes. Kids in Regina are on school strike. Go support them. Do everything you can. 
And if you don't know about the global school strike movement, please uh, look for a YouTube, go on Google, and look for Greta Thunberg, T-U-T-H-U-N-B-E-R-G. Greta Thunberg is 16 years old. She started the global school strike movement when she was 15. One child sitting in front of her sign with a school, with a sign in Stockholm, and she lays it out um, mercilessly to our generation. You adults, she said, do not even have the courage to tell it like it is. <laughs> even that burden you leave to your children. So the children are leading right now a global movement, and it is exactly as you say here. We cannot afford to, and we don't have 12 years either. I know that question earlier, I think it was from Ahmed. We don't really have 12 years because we only have now. Because to achieve what the IPCC says we have to achieve, we should have started decades ago. Certainly, if decades ago, we could have avoided climate change altogether. We procrastinated so long that we, can, we cannot avoid right now a very disruptive period of extreme weather events, environmental refugees, real dislocation. But if we can hold 1.5 degrees Celsius, not go above that in terms of global average temperature increase, we can get through this and survive. We can. But if it goes to two degrees, all bets are off because we, can, we will have unleashed runaway global warming, uh, self-accelerating, unstoppable releases due to the things that are, for instance, like releasing the methane from the permafrost, uh, burning our forests faster, releasing carbon, losing the ice over the Arctic and the albedo effect and warming the ocean currents. Some scientists don't think the IPCC is right. And they think, well, it may already be too late. But I have to believe that when we rely on science, we rely on the science we've got, it tells us we have a chance, but it tells us it's a one-time only chance. And the window on 1.5 is closing. And the, 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 the essential information is that we have that chance to survive. And any person who claims the term political leadership who's satisfied with where we are right now is a coward. We need to stand up and fight with both hands at all together so we have our military website, greenparty.ca, but actually look for Vision Green. Sometimes I find that it's hard to find on our website. I don't know. Anyway, Vision Green has a lot on personal privacy. But another one of the things we do is we want to make sure that we can afford all the programs we advance. So when we say abolish tuition, we know how to pay for that. Uh, we do. Uh, and one of the things about uh, how we pay for it is we have to look at these online presences that actually they seem like they're kind of invisible, magical, virtual companies, but Amazon and Netflix and Google and Facebook are taking billions of dollars out of Canada's economy. They're hollowing out and competing unfairly with the local bookstore, the local shoe store, because we would buy anything online for Amazon, it's delivered to your door. They don't pay any taxes to do that. So we have to look at, so the personal privacy question you ask is very important. Canadians have become accustomed to the idea that we don't need privacy. We do. We should not surrender our data. We should not surrender what we know about ourselves. We should be very circumspect in what we post on Facebook. And we really need to regulate the world of social media so that people cannot post anonymous comments online, so that we can 
verify identity and know that when someone came claims to be a Canadian citizen who's just discovered X, Y, Z about some politician, that they are a Canadian citizen and not working for Putin. Yeah, this is terrible. basic information we need to know. And I tell you, I talked to the Minister of Democratic Reform about this, Karina Gould, and I talked to the security advisors to the government of Canada. They don't think there's anything a government can do that really secures and protects a Canadian election for foreign interference. The one thing that can is a very alert citizenry that calls out when they see a news, uh, a, something that presents itself as a news source and is really a means of misleading voters, people like you who pay a lot of attention and know what's going on, call them out, show it publicly, ask someone to deal with it and remove it, because otherwise it could actually affect and distort the information on which Canadian citizens rely when they cast the ballot. So thank you, Dan. And I think Larry's coming up with a hook. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out and, and injecting some sense and sensibility when it comes to uh, politics in Canada, getting past a lot of the, the partisanship and that we need to work together if we're actually going to survive like the climate crisis. Um, saying that, I have two very quick announcements. I know it's getting late, so I won't keep you here too much longer. But I just wanted to make you aware that uh, Regina's school climate strike uh, will be occurring actually uh, Friday, March 15th from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. at the Saskatchewan Legislative Building. So if you're uh, a father, a mother, aunt, uncle, if you have children, bring them to the Saskatchewan Legislature. If you're a parent, if you're a teacher, please come and support this. This is very important. Everybody, bring the whole family. So I just wanted to make that announcement. And one other uh, thing to mention is uh, there's a, a second opportunity actually to, uh, if you didn't get uh, a chance to answer your question tonight, there's a second opportunity to ask it. Actually, at the pre-election forum, uh, forum on climate crisis, they will be held in Fort Quipel. So that's Wednesday, March 13th from 7 to 9 p.m. at the Treaty 4 Governance Center in Fort Quipel. So it's an uh, open discussion. Uh, it's being hosted by the Pell Valley Environmental Association. Uh, so other national leaders were invited, but uh, declined to attend, but Elizabeth May did actually uh, take the time out that she will be going to this pre-election forum on climate crisis. So I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight.